Wow, this is a nice big crowd. I don't think we were expecting this. But, you know, it's Yarmouth and it's a rainy day in March, so here you all are. Um, my name is Kim Dakin. I am a coach, uh, an author, and facilitator. And it's my honor to serve as your MC this evening for our very first Rooted Narratives performance. Um, before we get started, our theme tonight is a sense of place. So the stories that you're going to hear are rooted in Yarmouth, and they'll all be embracing that theme. But I'm kind of curious because there are a number of people in the room who don't necessarily hail from Yarmouth. And for those of us who are from everywhere else, it might be kind of interesting to find out who's in the room in terms of a sense of place. For people who are born and raised here, your attachment to Yarmouth is different in nature from those of us who chose to be here. So this was something I wanted to do physically in groupings around the space, but there's too many of you. <laughs> so now we're just going to do a show of hands in response to some questions. Um, I am a fan of sociometrics. That's like a fancy word for a process that just starts with questions and then the answers come in physical groupings. We don't have that space today, so we're just going to use raised hands. And I would like for you to get back in touch with the place you were born and raised. And for people who were born and raised all over the world, maybe you were in the military or your family traveled, think about the place that resonates for you when you think back to the place you were born. So those of you who were born and raised, for the most part, in a large urban setting or a medium urban setting, such as Portland down the road, raise your hands. Oh, nicely represented here. Nice. Good. And for those of you who were raised in a suburb. Yep. Nice. Okay. A few more of us raised in a suburb. 
A town like Yarmouth or a village. Those of you raised town, oh, nice. Gosh, we've got a great range tonight. This is nice. And for those of you who would consider yourself born and raised in the country, maybe you were raised on a farm, a kibbutz, a commune. OK, we have one hand raised. No, we have two hands raised. Nice. No, no, there's a few more? All right. OK. Thank you. A few more, a few more. I'm, I'm, I'm moving now to landscapes. If the most present landscape element in the place you were born and raised was prairie, like if you were born and raised in the Midwest, raise your hand. All right. A few prairie people here. For those of us raised where mountains were a prominent feature, raise your hand. Yeah, there's a handful of us here. Nicely done. Woods and forest, beautiful. Yes. And how lovely that we live here in Yarmouth where much of this is represented, right? We get to pick and choose. Now here's one that we don't have much of. For anyone born perhaps in the Southwest, or in Africa, or anywhere else, a desert country. Raise your hands. Yep, and we've got one right here. Yes, beautiful. Now I'm going to travel to water elements. What is the most prominent water element in the place you were born and raised? Now the nice thing about Yarmouth is that some of our, we've got water elements all over, don't we? We've got river, we've got ocean. So whatever resonates more with you in that place you were raised in terms of water, raise your hand if it's a river. OK, nice. And a lake or a reservoir. Yeah. Many of us who were born and raised in the American West, reservoirs were where we went. And the ocean. Oh yeah, beautiful, thank you. One more question. If you were raised in a country outside the US, please raise your hand. Okay, yep. And for those of us raised in a state other than Maine, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, we're well represented. And for those of us raised in a part of Maine that was not Yarmouth, raise your hand. Lovely. And for those of you born and raised in Yarmouth, please raise your hand. Whoa, okay, all right. So Yarmouth then is a place people choose to be, which makes all kinds of sense. Thank you for indulging me in that. And we are going to get started with our show after our friend Aaron tells us something about the draft comprehensive plan that's forthcoming. Thank you, Aaron. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aaron Zorko. I'm the director of planning and development for the town. Um, we're excited for the Rooted, Rooted Narratives community storing, storytelling event to get started. But first, I wanted to mention that this event corresponds with the release of our the community's new draft comprehensive plan update. Over the last year, the comprehensive plan steering committee, of which there's a couple of members in the audience here, um, the town staff and our consultants have been hard at work at research, analysis, and public engagement. There were focus groups with town committees and boards, community conversations on housing, economic development, and the natural environment online surveys, summer pop-up events throughout town, and a future land use workshop. The resulting draft comp plan outlines the vision, goals, objectives, and the priority prioritized actions to achieve them. The future land use plan is a core component guiding Yarmouth's future decisions on zoning, land preservation, public investments, and the built and natural environment. 
The release today marks the beginning of our 45-day public comment period, and you can view the draft on our town webs or on our project website, planyarmouth.com. And there's a hard copy for viewing in town hall and one in the back of the room if anyone wants to peruse the 500 plus page document. <laughs> um, so comments can be submitted through the project website or um, in writing to my department. We're excited to release this plan corresponding with this event. We have a series of stories tonight that showcase the power of place. The planning process and the community conversations around this comprehensive plan is intended to preserve, enhance, and transform uh, Yarmouth, building upon those fundamental things, intangible and tangible, that make Yarmouth such an important place for so many people. So thank you so much for joining us tonight for this uh, first of hopefully more um, community storytelling events. And I hope everyone enjoys the show tonight. Um, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Erin. And we will have a copy of that 500 page plan in the back if you'd like to spend the night here and peruse it. Um, there are people that I want to thank before we get started. Uh, thank yous to, of course, the writers and other writers who were not chosen for this specific night. Thank you so much for submitting your work. Uh, we also have thank yous, of course, for the Merrill Library for hosting this, and Maggie Mays for one delicious spread in that other room. Yes. <laughs> music was provided by Music with Friends, and I'm going to ask you to hold your applause until I'm done with all the thank yous. We have a lot. The Royal River Community Players for all of their support with this production. The submissions review panel comprised of Abdi Noor Ifton, who is also our keynote storyteller this evening, Anne Swardlick, Betsy Poulet, Charlotte Agel, Chris Sullivan, and of course the team from Island Port Press Publishing. Let's give them a hand. Okay, so. Our keynote story tonight comes from Abdi, entitled, Finding Home in a Small White Town. <laughs> Abdi is a Somali-American author, public speaker, and outdoor enthusiast. He moved to the right place. His book, called Call Me an American, vividly recounts his extraordinary journey from Somalia, and then Kenya, and then to the United States. His written work garnered prestigious accolades, including Maine's Lupin Award, and his captivating storytelling has been featured on NPR, on This American Life, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. He is a graduate of Boston College with a degree in political science, which I find very heartening. <laughs> he resides here in Yarmouth, where he works for Church World Service as a communications specialist. And he is a regular columnist for the Portland Press Herald and the Forecaster. Welcome, Abdi. Right here, right here. All right, so <clears throat> trying to pull this out. Um, <clears throat> my story begins with a number, LH420. Some of you are wondering. LH420 was a flight that I took to get to the United States 10 years and six months ago. Who remembers the flight number that long ago? Right? That's the question many people ask. You probably don't even remember the last flight you've been on yesterday. But I do because I printed out the itinerary when I came to the U.S. and still have it next to my bed. It's a very important document. And you will probably know why. It was a 21-hour flight. We left Kenya. We landed in Germany. And we were headed to Boston 
August 11, 2014. When we got to Boston, I was, I think, I was the only exci overexcited, probably, in the flight. Everybody else was either asleep, looked boring, and the person next to me thought I was restless. I was looking down the window, expecting to see the first sight of the United States. A few minutes outside of Boston, now the colors are there. It's almost 9 p.m. You can see the cars moving. You can see the buildings becoming closer and closer. I said, I'm here. And the next person, uh, the person next to me said, welcome, are you a Bostonian? I said, no, <laughs> I've never been here. Now, some of you know, when, you, when it's your first time immigrating to the United States, at least 10 years ago, um, they send an officer to you and you're, they, they do an extra interview. So that's what they did. They had me on a room and I remember sitting in that room and I couldn't actually control my emotions. So I, I couldn't hear what he was asking. And I was trying to be there, present. I had so many things going around my head. This is the first place. I had grown up in Somalia as a little kiddo, watched enough American action films to want to experience that. So I'm one of those 90s kid who had grown up with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Van Damme <laughs> and all the commandos and the Terminators. So my whole view of America is nothing more than lights, skyscrapers, Manhattan looking LA, Vegas, cops chasing down thugs. That's, that's the image that I had in my mind, right? Right there in that room, those were the things sort of going through my head. I'm now right here. I can't wait to see what's going on outside. And the officer obviously had a pile of documents that's all about me. And he asked me a question. He said, where are you going to stay in the US? And he knows the answer is right there in front of him. And I said, your mouth. <laughs> For those of you who have never been in Massachusetts, Maine, that's what you say, right? <laughs> your mouth. And he said, Yarmouth, Massachusetts. I said, yes, Yarmouth, Massachusetts. I have no idea <laughs> Mas what the difference between Massachusetts and Maine is. All I know is that the family that I'm going to stay with are in a place called Yarmouth. And, and now he looks at the document and he says, well, here it says Yarmouth, Maine. I said, yes, what did I say? <laughs> now he realizes, obviously, that I'm, you know, I sort of know, but then I don't, I don't know. So. I'm out, um, coming out of the airport. Uh, now, I do not have my biological Somali family anywhere in the US. So it's the first person, I am the first person of the entire family from Somalia who came to the US. There's a family like you who are from Atlanta, lived in Vermont for a while, now moved to Maine and have a house in Yarmouth, 10 acres, connects to the Royal River. And I'm going to stay with them. And obviously, when you immigrate to the US, you have to show a proof of residence, some sort of address. Now, the family have a Honda, and the Honda is sitting outside of Logan Airport. And I'm invited to sit in the back, lesson number one of your American experience, buckle up. <laughs> so I'm putting up the seatbelt, so confused. Why am I supposed to do that? Well, I get a little glimpse of Boston. But you know, when you leave Boston and you're headed to New Hampshire and you're driving to Maine on 95, 10, 30 at night, it's nothing but dark. I was very confused. I said, what happened to the buildings? Where is everything? Where are the people? Now, the family is more entertained because I'm asking these questions. And they said, we can, we'll get there. Now we're driving one hour and a half and we're not there yet. And I said, are we in the US? Um, I'm asking this question, obviously, because where I grew up, Mogadishu, Somalia, uh, the Civil War, going to the next neighborhood itself was a journey. So I didn't travel that much. In Kenya, with refugee papers, I didn't travel either. So I'm not used to this space. Traveling for hours and hours was not my thing. And so my thinking is, if we're driving more than an hour, we're leaving the country. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, we take exit 15. We're driving down to Sligo Road here in Yarmouth. Now we got here past midnight. I have no idea where I am. All I know is that it looks like a walking dead scene situation, <laughs> right? Very quiet. The walking dead scene is a horror movie. And I was not really into horror movies, I was into action films, right? So the family says, you're really tired, here's your room, just enjoy. So I didn't get a minute of sleep. I couldn't wait for the light next day to come out to see where I am, what the experience is. Now, for those of you who know Yarmouth very well, Sligo Road connects to North Yarmouth. And the house is right on the edge of North Yarmouth. It's a farmhouse, there's a horse, there's a red barn, um, there's turkey that goes back and forth. And that's the first thing I saw. I'm looking down the window that looks to the road. There's a group of turkey that's crossing from our end of the house and now casually walking to the other side. I said, what kind of chicken is that? <laughs> we don't have turkeys in Africa, at least. Um, the other window faces the barn, a big red barn, which is 100 years old. There's a horse, and now the chickens are out. The rooster can't stop making some noise, right? So somehow it feels like home. I hear the sounds I grew up with. Hearing a chicken is not what I expected in America. The whole point of moving to America is to experience the difference, right? The lights, the buildings, the subway, the trains, and all this. Nope, that was not the case. Now, my very first picture of Maine was myself standing in front of the barn feeding chickens. <laughs> I posted that on social media, and there were several comments from my childhood friends who have never been here but expected me to be filming myself in front of Brooklyn Bridge or Manhattan or Times Square. But here I was. And one friend commented, did they hijack you? <laughs> were you kidnapped? What is happening? And I replied, I don't even know myself. So Yarmouth except for the chickens and the rooster, was nothing like where I grew up, was nothing like what I had known. The neighbors' houses were closed, days have passed, I have no idea who leaves, lives, the house right across our house. Now I walk around knocking at doors and it's elderly community. It's no one of my age. There's no one I can play soccer with and there's, I, there was one Dunkin' Donuts right on Main Street, for those of you who remember 10 years ago. Now it's gone. So that was my to-go place. Two miles walk and two miles back. So four miles every day, loading, uh, loaded myself with coffee and obviously five donuts. Yeah. Right. The first few months obviously were very excruciating, I could say, psychologically struggling, and the family that I stayed with had offered everything and their power. Um, a walk in the woods, uh, kayaking before the, uh, the cold weather has arrived, um, a, a little hike up the mountains nearby, a walk to the ocean, all kinds of things. But nothing could make me feel at home. I was still disconnected. And one of, main, one of the main reasons why I couldn't feel at home yet was because my community was not here. The life that I was used to the communal life where we ate together, where we sat together, where we told stories, where we sit outside, again, speaking about growing up in a semi-desert, Somalia, where looking at the sky and looking into the stars at night, sleeping outside, was a thing. Whereas here, we have to be indoors. We're running away from the bags, from the mosquitoes. We're running away from something. You know, those were the first experiences. And I really did not know what the trick would be to remain in Yarmouth. I based back and forth. I went to Lewiston, I went to Portland, I lived with my community, I went to the mosque, I ate halal meal, you know, all kinds of things. And I kept coming back to Yarmouth. One night, I had a very long conversation with my mother. And I told her everything that I was living through. And she said, sounds like my childhood. So my mother is a nomad woman. She grew up in the wilderness of Somalia. She never owned a permanent house, but she, they had wealth. Wealth. They didn't dress well, but they had wealth. Hundreds and hundreds of goats and camel and sheep. That is described as wealth in Somalia. And she prayed for rain, rain, water, 
and peace and milk and butter, all things that we had. So I said, my mother lost that life. She moved from the wilderness and lost all her animals in 1977 because of a famine that wiped out Somalia's animals, livestock. She, she moved with my father, newly married, to the city, and she hated the city ever since, but she adjusted to it. <laughs> now she knows everything about that city because that's where I grew up, Mogadishu. That's where she had me. And she said, consider it that way, the opposite. Now you're no longer in Mogadishu. You're in this life, which I have lost. Those were the words that she said. Embrace it. And that is the key word. So I embraced Maine and Yarma. I embraced outdoors, which is an amazing therapy for people like me who grew up in a civil war. And then crazy enough, I kept getting into everything. I'm going to Sugarloaf, <laughs> getting myself all the way up, throwing myself down <laughs> just to get to know it, kayaking, canoeing, doing all kinds of things. And then obviously the word community can be defined in so many ways, it turns out. So now my community is here in this town. It's not that I'm going to their house every day to have tea and maybe bread like I did back in Somalia. But it's just that we get together, we have schedule, we hang out, we do things together as a community. In other words, I found a community that actually is not scared of the difference. And that, and embracing it, is what keeps me here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abdi. It's a beautiful, inspiring story. Um, and we have more to come. Our next storyteller brings us to the coast, down to the gritty beach pebbles and the sounds of summer, and what it means to belong within that peaceful setting and with those people. Alicia Emerson's writing is forthcoming and published in various literary magazines, including most recently the Dalhousie Review and the Solstice Magazine. Her nonfiction, one Solstice's 2022 nonfiction contest and has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net. While Alicia resides in Wyndham, her mother grew up in Yarmouth, and Alicia is overjoyed to return to this library where her mother discovered books like James and the Giant Peach and the Cricket in Times Square. Alicia will be reading lost and found in place. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you. I spent much of my childhood in Section 8 housing, a gray procession of condos we eventually managed to escape for a drafty old rental backdropped by the waste to energy perk plant. The factory's enormous smokestack loomed over our house. An onslaught of semi-trucks rattled the walls, and some days the air stank of eggs. Years later, my parents bought a house up the road, and whenever I visit, I pass by the factory. The rental slot is empty now, the house deemed uninhabitable and destroyed. Yet I suffer a nostalgic ache whenever I pass by the empty lot. It's irrational and strange how readily a place can become us when we are young. And this is why I'm so grateful for this privilege, this luck. Come summers, my family migrated to the Maine coast where and lived on my grandmother's campground. The crowded camper, a box so small, it spilled us daily, scattered us in different directions. Age eight, Nine, as soon as I could, I learned to walk safely down gravel paths, to push through white pine and hemlock, scrabble over rocks, avoid poison ivy, worship lady slippers, and take naps in moss. Entitled, I believed I was, to the beautiful views, the wild bucking coastline with its sand, rocks, and spray. I am grateful to my mother for letting me roam, 
to allow me to squat, whether she knew it or not, in the grit beside a country road, feeling important enough to note with a pencil and a spiral-bound notebook everything I saw. Smug, naive, and inconsiderate, I would tramp across the perfectly manicured lawn of a summer home so that I could better see the seals gathered by the shore. Even at a young age, no, especially at a young age, I was too proud to acknowledge that my life could be inferior to someone in possession of more cash. You can't buy these smells, I'd think, inhaling the salty air. You can't buy this feeling of sand. You can't buy this view. Of course, I'm old enough now to respect property laws and, <laughs> and to acknowledge that money can, in fact, buy you a view. <laughs> it bought plenty of views along that very coastline, as every time I visit, I notice fewer trees and more houses being built. But back then, I believed that entire peninsula was mine because I belonged to that peninsula. My grandmother sold the campground years ago. Still, I try to visit the public beach every summer, and I am so grateful for this public land. This past August, I ran into the father of a childhood friend. This friend and I were nine when we wandered to the beach and tucked ourselves into a gap between the sea roses. We were out of view, pressed low enough to avoid the thorns, and spent hours inventing riddles to the soft purr of waves, the chime of laughter chopped by wind. The ocean tangled in the leaves just for us, and my friend's father recalled his horror, how the entire peninsula panicked in an effort to find the two missing girls. People drove all over these streets shouting your names. Do you remember? I ran up and down the beach. I still can't believe you didn't hear us calling. God, I've never been that scared. I'm a mother now, and the memory churned through his features, his voice. I empathized. We didn't hear him calling. We were too absorbed in our game, in the burbly sound of sunshine and waves. But even still, all these years later, what I feel most when I reflect on this story is astonished. How could I have ever been lost in that place? That place held me, and it holds me still. I'm so grateful for the paths that I, as a child, could wander, that I could feel a sense of connection, of worthiness, of being found not by people, but by place. Thank you. Thank you, wow, there was such sensory loveliness in that story. And there is sensory, interesting sensory images in our next one. This is a uh, river ice. This one lingers on the power of the coast, but with a chilling winter's tale. It's written by Gro Flatabo. She's lived in Yarmouth for over 30 years, and she has the plot next door to mine in the Yarmouth Community Garden. <laughs> so. Um, she has worked for 25 years in the environmental field for the state planning office, the legislature, and as a consultant. She then earned her MFA at the Stone Coast program at USM and is now a writer. Please welcome Gro Flatabo with River <laughs> Thank you. And I also, again, want to give a shout out to the people who've organized this. It's not very often that writers get a chance to showcase their work. We're the crazy old uncle up in the attic. <laughs> so thanks very much. So 20 years ago, my husband and I bought a piece of land at the end of Bayview Street from Mary Estelle Blake. It fronts the Royal River, and I love watching the seasonal changes. Each spring, migrating shorebirds pick, rake the mudflats looking for food. Summer, it's boats and boats and boats and more boats. In the fall, seals and lobstermen come in the harbor after the bait fish that swim up the channel. When we first moved in, the river froze solid most winters, and we would watch the deer and coyote crossing from one side to the other. Once the ice broke, 
I track the blocks of ice going in and out each day. Eider ducks would roost on the blocks. It was like a conveyor belt. They'd go out and two hours later come right back. <laughs> so Mary Estelle was our next door neighbor. And for those of you who didn't know her, she was a piece of work. <laughs> a five foot tall, solid block of attitude. Gruff and opinionated, but with a little soft spot underneath. She was the last of six generations on Brown's Point, and she carried her family stories with her. She was 87 in 2008 when she had a house fire. Volunteers from the community and her church emptied her house after the fire and loaded old photos, papers, and bric-a-brac into gray plastic tubs before storing them in the barn across the street. I later helped clean out and organize her bins. After the fire, she joined her family for dinner a couple of nights a week. Even at 87, she ate like a lumberjack <laughs> and left her plate clean. I used those nights at dinner to figure out Mary Estelle's family history, trying to bring order and structure to all the stories she told. So who's Clarence, I asked one night. I'd found an eight by 10 black and white portrait of a handsome man with only the name Clarence penciled on the back. He had a presence in the family, in the photo, and with a strong eyebrows and friendly smile, he kind of looked like Gary Cooper. Oh, Clarence, Clarence was my uncle, married to my mother's sister, said Mary Estelle. She fiddled with a cloth placemat in front of her, rubbing it between her thumb and forefinger. But my aunt had sung with the opera in New York City. She was hoity-toity, and they were separated. <laughs> Mary Estelle put her napkin on the table and started folding and refolding it. Uncle Clarence drowned in the river right out there. What? Wait a minute, wait. I had lived on Bayview Street for 15 years by that point. I had never heard that story. What? Sure. February 24, 1941. The week after the ice went out, she said. Clarence had wanted to re-roof a hunting shack out on Leighton's Island at the mouth of the Royal River. It's close enough, we can see the island from our living room. By all accounts, his camp was falling in. Mary Estelle was home from church when he came by that Sunday morning. So she walked down to the wharf with Clarence and his girlfriend, Eva, and helped them load a shallow-sided, flat-bottomed skiff that they kept loaded at the shore. There were still pockets of ice hugging the shoreline. Clarence and Eva planned to work all day, then spend the night on Lanes Island and row back late Monday afternoon. Clarence was dressed for a day of carpentry work in his hunting coat, bean boots, and heavy work gloves. She, on the other hand, looked like she was going shopping. <laughs> she had a mouton coat, plaid trousers, a pair of galoshes, and red striped mittens. No work gloves for her. They were in a hurry to get off before the wind came up. Mary still watched them for a while before she walked back up to her house. The next day, Mary Estelle and her family were worried when Clarence and Eva hadn't returned by sunset. There'd be no moon that night, so Mary Estelle took a lantern and put it out on the wharf. The tide was going out, and there'd soon be a long stretch of med flats between the island and the river channel. It'd be hard to get off Lane's Island, and harder still to get onto Brown's Point at low tide. Mary, Mary Estelle, her brother, and father took turns checking the shore. At 8 o'clock, Mary's brother Edmund 
ran into the house. Call the police! He'd heard Clarence and Eva on the river, and they were in trouble. In February, the river ice can be powerful and unstoppable. I've seen ice blocks two feet thick and 40 feet long. The chunks mow down and submerge any buoys in their path. At low tide, the channel is narrow and there's no room to maneuver. Even now, you rarely see boats out on the river that time of year. Clarence would have been rowing with his back to the outgoing tide and the blocks of ice coming down the channel. Once at the shore, Mary Estelle, her brother and father, heard Clarence and Eva calling out. They were not together. Their skiff must have overturned. We heard her scream, oh my God, several times that night from the cold, cold river. Each call was further and further and further out. Mary Estelle pursed her lips. There was nothing anyone could do. Nearest boat was half a mile away and not in the water. And there certainly were no Coast Guard helicopters in those days. Later, I looked up the story in the Portland newspapers, and sure enough, the banner headlines read, Two Feared Drowned at Yarmouth. The deputy sheriff managed to get a boat out after a few hours and found the overturned skiff downstream. But there was no sign of Clarence or Eva. From the Portland Press Herald, I learned that Clarence had once been an attorney in Brunswick and had been a state legislator. He was famous for introducing a bill to flog any man convicted of beating his wife. It didn't pass. <laughs> Eva was his secretary and a divorced mother to five girls. For the next few days, the newspaper followed the deputy sheriff's rowing back and forth, back and forth across the river, dragging the channel for their bodies. They found my uncle's body the second day, but after four days, they gave up searching for Eva. Her body didn't turn up until a week later near Shabig Island. Mary Estelle's hands were now folded on the table. Her eyes glazed over, and I could tell she was back in 1941, because I was the last to see those two alive. I had to identify her body. Mary kept her eyes lowered. They were half-lidded, but her eyebrows were raised. Don't you know, the dye from Eva's mittens bled onto her skin. In the morgue, her hands were covered in bright red stripes. Today, more than 80 years later, the ice has nearly flat flattened the wharf in front of our house. It's just a pile of rocks now, infamous with those who fish for stripers. The past few years, I've only seen skim ice in thin sheets drifting down from the harbor. But I can't look at the river without thinking of those two. How much more of Yarmouth's history is forgotten, hidden, or submerged on the river? Some of those images were worthy of Stephen King, I think. Um, our next reader uh, is Jen Dupree. And in her story, the protagonist falls hard for love and eventually for Maine. Brought to us by Jen, who is a library director, assistant editor of the Master's Review, and a writer. Her short work has appeared in Solstice, December, On the Rusk, and other places. And her novel, 
The Miraculous Flight of Owen Leach, was published in 2022. Jen Dupree will be reading Love, Maine. Thank you. It was really fun to um, write something new. I've been sort of mired in, in novel work, and so this was a great opportunity, and I really appreciate it. So thank you for having me. Home was Massachusetts, and I didn't want to be in Maine. Not when I was 11, 12, 13, 14. When I was 15, I developed a crush I thought was love on a boy who worked at the little grocery store at the top of the long hill my mother and I walked up for exercise. I picked an apple off the middle of a pile, and when they slid, predictably, he sweetly gathered them in his arms and smiled at me. My mother and I walked up and down that hill for milk and hamburger rolls and deli slices of provolone. She was happy I was happy, or at least distracted from my sadness. We had a house on the lake and a boat, and my parents couldn't see why that wasn't good enough. But I was lonely and consumed with self-hatred. We came to Maine for four-day weekends in the summer and every other weekend in the winter. No exceptions. Which meant I couldn't join any sports teams or be in any plays. I couldn't go to most birthday parties or sleepovers, and eventually people stopped asking. I'm an only child, and so I had no built-in social system, although my parents always encouraged me to invite friends along for the weekend, which I did, and sometimes those visits were fine. But more often than not, the days turned emotionally fraught as we ate too much sugar and got too little sleep. I have never been a person who can spend hours and hours with another person, especially a person who needs to be entertained. But back to the grocery store. He eventually moved on to work at the movie theater, which meant my mother and I saw a lot of movies. <laughs> eventually, he asked me to a movie. There really wasn't much else to do in that tiny town. And we, in the parlance of the 90s, started going out. We wrote long letters to each other when I was back in Massachusetts. And to my parents' relief, I couldn't wait to get back to Maine. He was the first boy to bring me a stuffed animal, the first boy I kissed so long and hard my lips bruised, the first person outside of my family to whom I declared my love. You can probably guess where this is going, but not how. When I was 16, he gave me a diamond and asked me to marry him. We kept it a secret from my parents, but because I was a teenage girl, I wore the ring to school and told, and told all my friends about it. My teacher, wisely, called my parents, and they weren't thrilled, but they didn't force me to stop seeing him or make me give the ring back. Maybe in part because it made me come to Maine so willingly. It was my first semester of college that he ghosted me, although it wasn't called that then. Just before I left for school, in the emotional farewell embrace meant, I thought, to hold us over for a few months, he abruptly told me he had brain cancer and that he'd be undergoing treatment in the hospital and wouldn't be able to write or call for a long time. He assured me he loved me. I didn't hear from him at all. Two months turned into six months, and I thought he died. But then, by then, my parents had sold our Massachusetts house and were living in Maine full time. When I came home on weekends, because habits are hard to break, I walked up and down that hill, to the grocery store, to the movie theater. He wasn't in either place. I didn't expect him to be, not really, but the echoes of him were on the rocks where we sat and kissed, in the water where we kissed, in the damp leaves where we kissed. I ran into a, his friend, a friend of his outside the movie theater where I was not waiting to see a movie. He said, he's not who you think he is. 
But what does a teenage girl with a diamond ring and bruised lips and a strong belief that her beloved is dying or already dead do with that information? Nothing. It was his grandmother, whom he'd been living with, who took mercy on me. She must have known I was a stupid, lovesick girl who believed this boy had cancer and was probably, right this minute, dying or dead. In the letter, she told me he didn't have cancer, that he had never had cancer. He had a baby on the way, with a girl who was not me. The grandmother even sent me a copy of the ultrasound, knowing, I suspect, <laughs> that I wouldn't believe her otherwise. It's true. <laughs> She told me she was doing this not to hurt me, but to help me get on with my life. It did not feel that way. It was then, with my heart reduced to ash, that I began to crave Maine. The frozen upswing of a wave, the bowing pine trees, the triangle of boulders in the brook beside the house. It seems unnecessary to mention how much I cried. I was, for once, grateful to not have anyone around. I cried mostly outside because my parents were desperate for me not to waste any more time on a boy who wasn't worth it. They were right in their way, but it didn't make me feel any better. I walked a lot, through snow and mud and leaves. I've always been a cautious walker, and so I've never really looked up at the birds, but rather down at my feet. And so I caught frogs in the cup of my hands. I particularly like the small ones called peepers, tracked chipmunks to cracks and stone walls, and identified patches of poison ivy to avoid. I sat on the dock and watched the loons duck into the water and tried to guess where they'd reemerge. I stayed out late so the bats would swoop over me, sometimes skimming my hair. I covered myself in off and lay on an old inner tube and looked at the stars. I wasn't trying to do anything except not dissolve. This isn't a story of some great thing happening to make my heart heal, but it did heal, eventually. It was a long time before I fell in love again, and I got that one wrong too. <laughs> but that doesn't matter. What matters is that I figured out that I can be by myself on dusty mountain trails and pebbled beaches and planked walkways through nature preserves. I can listen to lake waves tease the shore, wind bend the birches, birds I still can't identify call to one another. I can delight in the owl that lives in my backyard, the deer that seem unbothered by my appearance on a morning run, the ever-changing sunset slanted across the hills. By the time I fell in love for the third time, I knew I didn't need another person to ease my loneliness. I'd absorbed the feet-deep snow and relentless mosquitoes and wild patches of rhubarb and freezing cold ocean and steep, rocky mountains that seem impossible to climb but aren't. <laughs> Beautiful story, Jen. Um, and our next story also deals with the healing power of place, but distilled from the wonder and gratitude of a generation of new Mainers and new Americans. Daphne Gregory Thomas resides in Kennebunk. After summering down east her whole life, she spent 45 years as a high school educator in New York and New Jersey. She's got resilience stitched through herself. Her writing journey began through her participation at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Visible Ink Writing Program. She's been published in the annual Visible Ink Anthology and in something called Zibby Mag, which sounds wicked fun. <laughs> She has performed at the yearly Visible Ink Theater event and at Writer's Read. Ever the essayist, she is working on a memoir 
in essay form. This is My Affair with Medicine by Daphne Gregory Thomas. At five years old, I always want my mother. Once so badly, I get hit by a car. She's choosing fruits and vegetables from the truck that comes down the street once a week. A neighbor watching me turns for a bit of gossip, and I dash. I see my mother's green dress, the vegetable man filling her bag, the headlight of a black car barreling toward me. I hear her screams, stop, no, too late to matter. Thrown in the air, I land with a thud unconscious. My mother scoops me up, jumps in the car that hit me. She has no license, no car of her own, no other resource. Hospital, she commands. I wake up howling in a sterile room. A man in a white coat assures my mother. No broken bones, but a severe concussion. We'll set up appointments. Shaken, my mother is much relieved I'm not dead or too broken. She then thinks to ask, what's the cost of such a plan? Money is scarce. The doctor peers over his glasses. I'm a medical man, not involved with such matters. Once again, she lifts me in her arms, promises to arrange payment for his day's work on a weekly schedule. When informed of my accident, my distant father is grateful I'm alive and relatively intact. My mother is thankful for that he refrains from his pointy-headed declarations, a result of the education he's relentlessly pursuing, rendering him, him too busy to get more involved anyway. Rather than setting up the appointments the man in the white coat has prescribed, my mother quickly runs to the best medicine people she knows, her aging father, a myriad of elderly relatives, her six siblings. My erudite father hears of this and proclaims voodoo. <laughs> Though not formally educated, my mother turns from his judgment, trusting more the wisdom of her clan. Born into a family of poor Greek immigrants who fled poverty, war, and suffering in the old country for jobs in the textile mills on the rocky coast of Maine, she has grown up with their legendary homegrown re remedies and natural prescriptions for better health. Peculiar herbs, mountain teas, and specific foods are always in the mix. Fish caught that day, fresh killed chickens, and homegrown garden vegetables are a must. Each year, she and her four sisters free themselves from their hardworking, narrow-minded husbands and the urban cities of New York and New Jersey where work and marriage has scattered them. They bring all of their young children to spend the summer in the main fishing village where they were born. Important to keep the children healthy, they claim, when they pack up to leave each year. Their patriarchal husbands, wise to the conspiracy of the sisters who long for each other's company in the clean air of the rocky coast free from their demands, are annoyed by the loss of their service during this annual interval, but grateful for a respite from their bothersome children. <laughs> we stay in the rickety beach cottage of my gruff and weathered grandfather, where he lives year round. It is small and crowded with all of us sharing beds, one pull chain toilet, a pot belly stove, and a copper tub for collective bathing. Our ranks include his skinny dog and a suspicious cat. There are coop chickens and ducks we feed as pets and sometimes mourn on the occasion of their appearance plucked and roasted at the communal table. <clears throat> at his direction, we spend our days catching fish, digging clams, netting crabs, while he tends to his eccentric garden, growing vegetables we recognize and some that scare us. We never dare to question his edicts of eating, often holding our noses when he sits us all down to concoctions of strange boiled greens covered with mountains of mashed garlic, claiming in his very broken English, eat, eat, gonna make you strong like a bull. 
When we'd step on fish hooks or cut our hands on sharp edges of razor clams, he soaks our injured body parts in the cold, healing salt waters, and we carry on. When we burn our skin in the high sun, he covers us with vinegar and stops the sting. A waterlogged ear is cured with heated drops of the thick Greek olive oil he uses for cooking everything. <laughs> in spite of our crowded, clamorous living circumstance, we never get sick. In the colder months, after we tearfully leave our place of health and protection from all illness to head back to our grumpy fathers and cloistered lives of school and too many rules, trips back north are always in the mix when sickness emerges. When a cousin contracts scarlet fever, a mystical great aunt reads the grounds at the bottom of a muddy coffee cup, pins an evil eye on an article of clothing, spits three times on the ground by her feet, two, 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 and prescribes traveling north. Take her to Maine to breathe the air. Be sure to soak her feet in the ebb tide. An uncle suffering a pneumonia is advised the same journey with explicit directives. Take food from the ocean, suck the meat from a sea urchin, eat an oily mackerel, and pick the bones. A young relative worried over a difficult pregnancy is driven 14 hours to face the full moon at low tide. <laughs> While a withered aunt, a revered elder, swings a scissor on a string back and forth <laughs> over her belly to hold the baby that is coming. <laughs> So it is soon after my early childhood running, run in with a speeding black car, I'm carried off to Maine in the spring for the medicine I need most. After arriving, I eat fresh caught fish, vegetables canned from the summer before. I help my grandfather plant his new garden for the upcoming season, fertilizing it with the skeletons and heads of the fish we just consumed. I have him, my mother, and visits from wrinkled old relatives all to myself while I heal and wait for summer, the arrival of my cousins and their mothers to join me. My wizened grandfather rose me in his leaky old wooden boat to explore small islands covered with seals and gulls and blankets of shells, proclaiming, this ocean, all for you, look here, Look there, you learn everything, providing lessons that encourage my damaged head to be curious, think beyond, and repair. As with most affairs, mine began, begins in the need of a moment. I'm too young to understand that the time and way I spend my childhood summers protected from sickness and when I'm wounded, flies in the face, face of conventional medical advice, instead relying on the healing hands of the folk medicine of my heritage. I'm cheating on progress, entering into an affair I will come to rely on that will one day save me again. Eventually, my grandfather, the old sages, and the five sisters dwindle to their natural deaths, voices, fading in the distance. As life continues without them, I hold their legacy with the same fierceness they instilled in me, believing in the powerful medicine of the rocky coast and salt air that informed my healing as a child. Years later, when I'm diagnosed with a killing disease, new doctors in white coats provide me with medicines and treatments that in spite of their modern powers, indicate I will have little time left. This may buy you some time, they say, just enough to get your affairs in order. I thank them for their honesty, just as my mother did, a medical man in his white coat so many years ago. I follow in her wise footsteps, continue my yearly journey to the same Maine coast and salt waters, the same fish to catch and air to breathe, to the place where my affair 
with this medicine began. I continued to defy my doctor's predictions, leaving many who made them scratching their heads when they asked me how. I tell them of the affair that I will never quit and invite them to do the same. Try it, I say. Go north. Plant your feet in the ebb tide. Breathe in the salt air. Eat what you catch and pick the bones. You never know. You might want to start an affair of your own. <laughs> It's a beautiful story. Thank you, Daphne. Um, our final story comes from Ed Ainsworth, who unfortunately could not be here tonight in person, but it will be read by Jamie Orenstein, an actor with the Royal River Community <coughs> Players. Ed moved to Yarmouth in 1950. He spent all of his primary school years in town. Growing up here, he also had the experience of maintaining several cottages and homes in the Princess Point, White Cove, Little John Island areas. He is a former town manager of Lisbon, Bar Harbor, and Falmouth. He and his family returned to Yarmouth in the early 80s, where he has resided ever since. Our performer, Jamie Orenstein, often haunts the cemetery around Halloween as part of the Royal River Community Players Annual Stroll Haunted Yarmouth, where he played a philanthropist, a potter, Yarmouth's first dentist, and the paymaster of the Forest Paper Company. In real life, James works as a lawyer to help people resolve their disputes without going to court. Here's Edward Ainsworth's The Yarmouth Lobsterman, read by Jamie Orenstein. Back in the 1920s, Yarmouth was going through some rough times. The biggest employer in town had been purchased and was shifting its production to another place, Westbrook. The forest paper company had closed and many of the workers had left. Businesses suffered severely. And the town of Yarmouth entered a long period of decline that did not change until after the Second World War. However, through it all, there were the local fishermen who just would not quit. And one of those men was Harry Morton, known as the Lobsterman of Yarmouth. He had established his home on Morton Road and built his traps from his shop next to his house. Now, this shop was quite the place. It was not really big enough to be a garage, but it had to be big enough to hold the electric saws and other equipment needed to put together the lobster traps which supported his family and business. During the winters, this was a very busy place. This shop also provide, provided the spot where this story of Yarmouth's history was made. And it all started with the sawdust being everywhere because he really had cut up every board and strapping that was used to make the traps. Any extra wood scraps would be thrown into a pile over in the corner and they became the source of heat on another day when burned. Oh, a fire was absolutely a requirement to help warm up this shop uh, during the cold winter days. So uh, a metal barrel was uh, adjusted to have a door on one end and a, a metal pipe out the other and four short legs to get it up off the floor. The result was a unit that would hold lighted wood scraps and generate enough heat to keep the building warm and very productive. Of course, that vent pipe out through the side of the building never looked very safe, but no evil result ever occurred from its precarious arrangement. There were other parts of this shop that uh, made it unique. The lights all hung down from the ceiling from what looked like extension cords. These cords were all pieces of wiring that had been arranged in a unique manner. And over between the, the table saw and, and the workbench was something that looked like a can. No, it was a spittoon. After chewing on some tobacco for a while, Harry had the unique ability from wherever he was in the shop of spitting whatever was no longer wanted right into the pot. He informed me that 
with the pot over there, he could keep the flies down. But how he could do that with, with those sharp nails on his, in his mouth was a real question. Yet he would continue to build the traps with the nails from his mouth after he had lubricated them with tobacco grease. Oh, oh uh, the nails had to be taken out one at a time. And uh, just before using them on the trap, they had to have the sharp end blunted with a couple of taps from the hammer. Then they were turned around and used to build the trap. This was a very necessary process because by blunting the pointed ends of the nails, they tore through the hard oak wood that otherwise the nails would have split apart. Harry was a very busy man. He docked his boat in Portland because it was closer to the source of fish bait, to the selling of the catch, and to providing the uh, boat with fuel. But all this was accomplished after some rough days when he, had, when he had started fishing. You see, after the stock market crashed in 29, there did not seem to be enough money for people to buy fish or lobsters. Harry realized that he would have to be quite innovative if he was going to make it. And eventually, the opportunity arrived. He knew there was a point of land down off Princess Point where he could coordinate with some other men to bring some money back to town. Now, this point of land in Yarmouth, off what is now Sandpiper Cove Road, is where there's deep water at high tide and, and some steep rock ledge on, on two sides. And this could be the answer. At low tide, there's some uh, mud flats for a few clams, but this could be exactly what Harry needed to get by during these tough times. So he checked out the tides and, and some other schedules and learned that on one day the next week, at 10 o'clock at night, Everything was aligned. He agreed to meet his buddies down at the rocks. And that day, he finished up his fishing and refueled his boat. And then at dark, he took off for the islands, met some other boaters, picked up his fish, and headed back to shore. Only this time, he deviated and went to the spot off Princess Point where everybody had agreed to meet. And wouldn't you know, they were all there with their lanterns and flashlights. He pulled the boat into the narrow bit of deep water between the ledge outcroppings where men on both sides immediately started unloading the fishy hooch. And very soon, he was able to pull back out into the bay, return to his, to his normal boat slip, and went home for a good night's sleep. Harry later became known as the rum runner of Casco Bay. <laughs> he was able to keep his fishing business alive and well for the rest of his days. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie. Delightful stories, and that was our final one. So I'd love to have a round of applause for the readers and the writers. Thank you so much. And hopefully this evening comprises the first of many of these narrative evenings. In fact, maybe some narratives from a couple of you out in the audience. Thank you so much for coming. Yarmouth Comprehensive Plan team decided that they wanted to have a, a little, uh, a fun little contest where they invited the public to uh, submit an essay about what they love about Yarmouth. And um, I submitted one, and I was devastated when it wasn't chosen to be one of the ones that that got to read in in front of the public. So I complained enough that they they gave me an opportunity to do it um, today. So here I am all by myself doing this thing today, but I'm really feeling good about this. North Road Playing Fields, welcome to small town America. My wife Robin and I moved to Yarmouth 27 years ago. We were living in Massachusetts and both working, and one day we woke up and we had three kids. We lived in a wonderful neighborhood in a beautiful community, but life was becoming increasingly difficult because, as I mentioned earlier, we were both working and had three kids. Commuting around Boston was awful. 
One of us had to be home most days at 5 p.m. to relieve the babysitter, daycare center, friendly neighbor. And since we were living in the world before cell phones and Zoom and all that good stuff, one or both of us was driving down 128 like a bat out of hell at 445 each weekday night, trying not to be that last parent to pick up your crying child. Robin and I had both gone to college in Maine. And whenever we had the chance to vacation, Maine was almost always at the top of our list, no matter what time of year. So perhaps subliminally, we began to dream about finding some way to make Maine work for us. As luck would have it, Robin's job with Smith Barney in Boston was looking for a branch manager in Portland, Maine. So although Robin had just recently entered the Smith Barney branch manager training program, they fast-tracked her and offered her the position. Even more fortuitous, when we mentioned this to our neighbors uh, that we were contemplating a family relocation to Maine, they reluctantly told us that another family from across town had just made that same move to Maine in the past year. We connected with that family, and they told us about a place called Yarmouth, and we hardly looked anywhere else. So it was midwinter when we moved. Robin was starting her big new job as a branch manager, so I was tasked with the job of getting the family adjusted into this new community in Maine. So as is always the case, there was very little real estate available in Yarmouth that winter, so we found a seasonal rental house and got our two school-age kids uh, enrolled in the Yarmouth schools, our daughter into daycare, and we began settling in. We had been attending a Methodist church in Massachusetts, but oops, Yarmouth didn't have a Methodist church. And our kids had really been active in the YMCA swimming program down in Massachusetts, but alas, Yarmouth was considering uh, building a new YMCA over in the Freeport side of town, but that was still a few years away. So no church, no swimming pool, and again, it was midwinter and it was hard to meet people. In fact, if not for the school families, we would have been very lonely that winter. But eventually spring arrived. We quickly learned that spring in Maine comes very late, if at all. I had signed my oldest guy up for Little League, and on what seemed to be the first warm and sunny Saturday morning, we were told to report to the North Road playing fields for the first day of Little League baseball. It seemed like the whole town was there, certainly every family with kids. And there was something for everyone. A playground with swings and slides and all that kind of good stuff for our three-year-old daughter, Becca. And three baseball fields and a snack bar. For me, for our whole family, this was heaven. But then, in an instant, it all disappeared. Being a lifelong baseball fanatic, I could not keep myself from being that overzealous dad and lending my vast knowledge of the game to the coaches of my 10-year-old son's team. So while Robin was occupied watching our daughter over on the playground, I found myself imparting unsolicited instruction on the fine art of hitting a baseball and completely ignored our 7-year-old son. Next thing I know, I hear this loud scream, and our son had just wandered into some eager 11-year-old kid's swinging baseball bat. Immediately, I go from being that parent providing unsolicited hitting instruction to that parent of an unsupervised 7-year-old who has just been walloped on the head by a baseball bat. Volunteer medical personnel were on the scene immediately, and it was determined quickly that our son needed to be taken to the hospital ASAP. Being new, we had not a clue. The advice being given to us was to go to the Maine Medical Center in Portland, now. So my wife and I grabbed our stricken son and our daughter and we abandoned our 10-year-old son and headed in the direction of Portland. Remember, this is before cell phones and GPS and all that. We were simply looking for a blue H on the side of the road somewhere along the highway to Portland. We eventually ended up at Mercy Hospital on High Street, don't ask how we got there, and our son was seen and after a few anxious moments, released and declared okay. Phew. So we drove back to the North Road playing fields, 
Our older son was still there. This is a couple of hours later. And a gaggle of his friends and a few concerned parents. And it was suggested that we maybe buy a round of frozen popsicles for the group. And while our seven-year-old mostly used his frozen popsicle on his still aching head, we all settled back into enjoying the Norman Rockwell small town little league scene at the North Road playing fields, which became, despite the initial incident, a treasured destination for our family for the ensuing years. But what makes this whole day even more memorable to me is the following. When we finally got home, back home that later that afternoon, after the emergency trip to Mercy Hospital and all the rest, we had just settled back into our home when a car pulls into our driveway and out jumps Judy and town manager Nat Tupper and their three boys. They had with them a just purchased wiffle ball bat and ball and the message was, welcome to Yarmouth. We care about our neighbors. I can't tell the story without tearing up a little bit. It meant so much to our family to know that people cared. And from that point on, we knew that we had found a wonderful new home in Yarmouth, Maine. And every time I pass by the North Road playing fields, I have a smile on my face, especially when I see kids and families out there enjoying small-town America. Thank you. Thank you.